So um, we're going to continue on. <clears throat> what we were talking about, let me see if I can get that title, contrasting the time of life with the time of death. Now, maybe you've noticed, maybe you've read those stories many times over <clears throat> and never really understood that in God's way of dealing, He's not just trying to give us new life in the sense of the way that we think Christianity is just new life. In other words, all happiness and healing and blessing and everything more working out perfectly because he also has a time of death. And that time period is a time that is most important to him. <clears throat> just as uh, Jesus' time down here was most important to all of us, and to the Father in the manner in which the Son gave himself first, first to the Father and to the things of the Father's plan to make himself known through, you know, it was, uh, it was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world, but in the fullness of time it be it became understood as Christ crucified, but it's the same thing <clears throat> because it's a nature, because it's a spirit, because it's, it is God. It is what God is like. And, um, and that's, that can be real difficult for a lot of people because they, you know, um, you know, they say, well, you know, I believe in a God of love, but, you know, John 3, 16 is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The, the words there are that he gave up unto sacrifice, his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish. Believe in who? Just Jesus walking the earth? No. Believe in the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, the lamb that will, will uh, that is now, but I mean, even back then, before he was risen, <clears throat> he would be a slaughtered lamb on the throne of, for lack of a better phraseology, on the throne of the universe. And, um, and that, phrase of course that you hear many times from me for God so loved the world meaning that he loved in this manner that he gave up his only begotten son and he did that that we might have get ready his life he didn't just do that so because we always think in terms of ourselves and we think in terms of you know that I'm not going to go to hell so he gave me eternal life and I won't go to hell so, and God just loved me so much he didn't want me to burn in hell. <laughs> Don't talk to me right now. Anyway, uh, um, <clears throat> he loved his son too, but he loved us in a manner of, that relates to sacrifice and cost and giving of your life that others may have his life, his life, his life. It's an eternal life is not us. You all have heard many, especially most of you in this room, but you've heard me, you've seen it drawn on the board where, you know, I just draw this, this picture of, of, of eternity past and then eternity future. And we, in that process, we're somewhere on this. We're, we're somewhere on this timeline. And wherever we are, even if our head looks bashed in a little bit, or you look like a Hershey kiss yeah. head, Hershey kiss head, um, we mark that from that point on we have eternal life but eternal life is without beginning and without end well that's not us that's christ 
It's his life in us that you might have eternal life, that we might have eternal life. <clears throat> anyway, so, it, you know, it's uh, when you start moving out of just the general uh, generalities, generalities, I can't even say the word. That word that uh, she just said, the, the, just the general thinking in terms of Christianity of me, 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 and, and, and me happy, and me blessed, and me all of this, um, then it becomes okay if God kill, you know, kills his son for us. Now, oh, well, that's okay. Yeah. But it's not okay for you to lay down your life for God. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ lives in me. See? And uh, it's, it's the reversal. It's Christ dying so that I might have life. And then Paul reverses it and he dies. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. Christ liveth in me. He's, his point was, I will die. I will embrace the cross. I will embrace this reality that is God, not just something he did 2,000 years ago. Um, and I will die not just for the world, but for him to be able to live in me. And if we really understood um, him living in me, then we would understand that it's not just somehow when we pray to prayer and ask Jesus to come into our heart, that that was the fulfillment of that. And that's probably what Paul did in a sense, in a sense, you know, um, uh, Ananias, wasn't that his name? What was the name of the guy that prayed for him? And, and so he, he came and he prayed for him and, you know, and, you know, I'm sure he was saved and, and, and you, what you hear from his sermons and, and his speaking and what he was saying in the book of Acts when he got saved, it was primarily that Jesus is the Messiah. That's what it was. Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, so then, 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 this, uh, this awakening to the way God is. I mean, that's beyond, that's beyond just going, because he did this. He went to Jerusalem and sat down with Peter and all those guys and, you know, found out a whole lot of what Jesus of Nazareth did, I'm sure. But then he went out into the wilderness in Arabia. And he was in Damascus. And he, by the Holy Spirit, the, the gospel that I, re, I, I preach is not of man. I didn't get it. And he goes through that in Galatians. You know that. He wants to make a point. I mean, it's all, it's all the way through Galatians. It's not just Galatians 2.20. It is all through Galatians that, that this, uh, this one came to give himself and Paul recognizes that it's, um, that this way is bound up in a father and with his son and with the Holy Spirit and that they had something before the foundation of the world. Okay, so let's talk about eternal life again, okay? He is eternal life. God is eternal life, stretching eternity past and eternity future. Then this spirit, if that's God, I mean, let's... <laughs> 
let's just take us out of the equation. Let me just erase us off of that timeline and talk about the one that was and is and is to come. You ever heard that before in the scripture? Okay, well, we go, well, praise God, you know, he's going to last forever. I mean, that's kind of our, you know, he's going to last forever. He is, and was, and is, and is to come. So he's going to be around. Um, it's not about something uh, lasting. It's about something that was and is and is to come and always will be in relationship to the, to the Godhead, to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. And that interchange, that relationship, that flow that they have. Um, the, the New Testament is full of it. Full of it. Um, one of them I've been meditating on for a while is, is John 17. Verse four, and Jesus says, this is, you know, he knows he's, he's gonna die soon, right? He knows this is, you know, just before <clears throat> the cross. He hasn't even gone to the cross for sins yet. But he's praying certain things. And in verse four, he says, I have finished the work. I have glorified thy name. I have glorified you, Father. Because that's who he's talking to. <laughs> okay, we go. Well, I'll, I, will, I will finish my course. I will, I will be a Christian till my, till my dying breath. Yeah, the, are you glorifying yourself? Are you, are you intent on glorifying yourself? Are you planning, you know, how to be seen better, look better? I mean, you know, isn't it interesting that this society is nothing like it was when I was young. There are opportunities at the kazoo to glorify yourself. <laughs> and it's not just for the kids. The adults jumped on that boat, too. Amen. And, um, and, and we can't blame technology for that. That's, that's us. That's our problem, even Christians. I mean, you know, pawning ourselves off as the anointed when Jesus is the anointed, the anointed, which is another term for that. This, the exact term for that is the Messiah. He's the Messiah. We are not the Messiah. Well, I'm one of them. No, no, you're not. No, you're not even one of them. You're not even close. In fact, you're going in the exact opposite direction. He gets lower, and you want to exalt yourself. See? Now, you know, I have to tell you <clears throat> that before I came, um, I took a shower and I combed my hair. And I put on nicer clothes. Yeah, aren't y'all glad? Yeah, praise God. I just want y'all to know that. I just, no, no, my point, is, <laughs> my point is, is that I'm not doing that to quote unquote look better, to be thought of better or whatever. Um, I'm doing it for her so I don't smell like what I look like before I take that shower. <clears throat> no, and for you and whatever, but you know, so I, I understand, I understand a certain amount of doing things, but we're talking about, we're talking about a heart that would think regularly about how to uh, uh, what is, what is the thing on Facebook called? Not just Facebook page, but there's a name. What? No, no, no. Anyway, it, it, your profile. And, you know, people just working on that. Da, da, da. Oh, let me put these 
pictures up and, you know, I want you to see me with my kids. My kids are happy, you know. Do you think, do you think in any of those, there's not times at home that it's just crazy like Satan's house? Do you think that could be the, be the case? Do they put any of those pictures up? Okay, but it's not really even about, again, social media or any of that stuff. It's, it's about what's working in our heart and he knows us and he knows our heart and we don't. We think that we're better than we are. And, you know, I, I, just, I just want us to have Christ formed in us in such a manner that our lives will be like what Jesus said, I finished the work, I glorified you. Well, that's the Godhead, that's his place in the Godhead. He did it, he did it. I mean, a lot of our glorifying Jesus is, well, I get up in front of people and I preach a good message and people go, oh, that was a really good message. You know, oh, you're you know, so good. Do you know how often I hear that? Seriously, that somebody comes up and says, that was a good message. I won't tell you. I will. It's hardly ever. I mean, some, some. But I don't miss that. I, I kind of think that that may be because they got Jesus out of it. And they're glorying in what the Lord is saying to them personally and, and touching their lives and whatever. I can't touch anyone's life. I can't heal. I can't, I can't speak anything that would move anybody unless the Spirit of God just decided to fall on you, if you understand, you know, fall on it on you. So... So Jesus is saying, before he even goes to the cross, before he even dies, before he does this great work of completely dealing with sin, with the devil, with the old nature, all this stuff, he goes, I, I finished the work. I have glorified you my time not while I was down here. That's what I've lived for. That was my purpose, my greater purpose. And, you know, you, you probably wouldn't hear the magnitude of his little statement there unless you understood something of the Godhead, how they work, the interchange, the way that they're not going to, you know, declare themselves and they're, they're going to just seek him. But there it was. I finished the work. I've glorified you. All right. So, um, for us, recognizing um, that the true uh, aspect of that is like Paul, who said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, Christ lives within me. I'm crucified so that Christ may live within me. That's different than saying I went to an altar and asked Jesus to come into my heart. It's totally different. It's not the same thing. It is not the same thing. One of them is a general, I mean, not a, a one of them is an, a real grasp of what the cross was meant to do personally in our lives in terms of not I, but Christ. Not I. Not me and Christ, but Christ, and not I. And um, you can't strive hard enough for that to get there, because it's not a striving. It is, in some cases, what, what we might call in the vernacular, a shocker. Because we, we were not expecting it to be quite that. <laughs> okay, so, so now we're, we're talking about 
Sarah, and we're talking about the Shulamite, Shulamite. Shunammite. Thank you. The Shunammite. And them having a visitation of God to bring forth the seed in them. No mention of death. No mention of that, though that's huge. Because in God, that's always a factor in the sense of laying down your life for the other. Always. It's how they think. It's how they move. It's what they do. It's, you know, it's love. God is agape. You know, he's not kindness. He's not mercy. He's merciful. He shows kindness, but he's love. He is love. And as such, in that spirit, it is, in God's mind, love is not I, but Christ. Or not I, but, but another. You know what I'm saying? Not I, but another. And um, so, so they are thrilled once the, once the life comes. Weren't you thrilled once you got born again? <laughs> thrilled when the life comes. And they think that their life is going to be in connection with the happiness of this other life. Right? I mean, it's, it's two of them. Mom, maybe three, dad, but mom for sure, and dad. I mean, mom and the seed. And so it's like, okay, so it was me and I, I was barren and now I got the seed and yes. And, you know, and then you just walk and there's, you know, of course there's stuff that happens, but there's still that bond, but no mention, no mention that Sarah, Shunammite, There's going to come a time when it's going to be not the time of life anymore. It's going to be the time of death. And I'm going to need you to be with me. It doesn't, even, it doesn't mention death and it doesn't mention resurrection. Okay? It's just time of life. And I know we were excited when we got to that, that part. But we're about to get into the part now of the time of death that must, it must follow. It must follow. So, um, so I'll read a paragraph that I finished with last time and then um, both of these situations with Sarah and the Shunammite started with the promise and then the joy of finally and miraculously receiving the seed. Amen. <clears throat> but contrary to their way of thinking, the time of death also eventually came. It came without warning or prior information from God. In other words, it was completely unexpected. It also came as an apparent unfair death. You say, well, maybe with the Shunammite, but not with Sarah. La, 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 la. La, la, la. Maybe you're wrong about that. Maybe I'm wrong. We'll see. <laughs> if we ever get there. <clears throat> All right. So... Unexpected. It also came as an apparent unfair death. Notice the Shunammite response in, ver uh, <clears throat> in that verse. Then she said, did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? We may not reveal it now, but Sarah was also negatively affected by it. <clears throat> All right. So uh, where I left off, but God's whole purpose for granting the firstborn would be to eventually see how they handle him taking it from them in terms of, of God taking the firstborn from them in terms of suffering unjustly 
or death. All right, so, well, that's First Peter. Okay. And, and uh, I think in the last class in First Peter, we even highlighted this thought concerning a test. Remember that? Test. And it had to do with this very thing. It's a test. God tests us. You, you know, you look at Sarah and you go, oh, wow, you know, I wish I was the mother of all living. <laughs> I wouldn't like to see the living. <laughs> Just kidding. But, uh, you know, or, or the Shunammite, I wish I, you know. Well, you are that. He's given you the seed. And he's going to expect you to do something with that seed in terms of death and being with him in terms of that death so that there might be indeed a resurrection or no or not you know or just problem suffering um, when that testing begins attitudes and reactions are weighed by god would their attachment to god's gift be greater than their willingness to give god what he wanted and had planned all along you know, no, no. See, it was surprising um, on a certain front. I think Abraham and Sarah waited so long, it's like, okay, I mean, she laughed. So, you know, there's this time of being able to weigh attitudes and reactions and, um, and it, what, what is that doing? What is the Lord trying to do in our life? He wants to see if your attachment to your little son Jesus that is so you know, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, that is so precious to you and saved you and did all this stuff for you, if you will, if you're willing to lose that that promise seed and gain the father's seed, the father's son, the father's son as he really is. Not Jesus of Nazareth, not walking around and blessing and doing all this stuff and everything else. I mean, that all happened, uh, but there came a time when even the disciples had to give up that Jesus. And the residue of that continued a little while into the book of Acts, but that wasn't the main theme after a while. And it became less and less as the epistles began to be written. So, um, would, they ha would they have a change of relations with that son after the death? Would they change from, from it just being Jesus of Nazareth, the one we read in the Gospels, to Jesus, the Lamb of God, the one that is mentioned and talked about in the epistles. Or higher than that, forget the epistles, the Father's heart, or the one that was with him before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> I mean, the father, see, this is, this is where Jesus comes up with, he's talking to him, he says, look, no man knows the father except the son, and nobody knows the son except the father. Well, there's something about us y'all don't know. No, no, I know, you, you're a miracle worker. You'll do this, you'll do that. And again, I'm not against miracles at all, I'm not. Um... I'm not. I see them fairly regularly. I do. Um, but my relationship, well, how about the three Hebrew children in, in Daniel 3? You know, God is able to deliver us, but, okay, well, he didn't. You understand? He didn't say God's able to deliver us, and he will. You know, and if he doesn't, I'm going to quit God. 
um, it was, if it doesn't, I'm not going to get out of this by my own actions, by bowing. I'm going to be with him with whatever he wants to take me into. That's a completely different definition that most people have of those scriptures. <clears throat> okay, so uh, for many such things are strange fire. That's a quote from 1 Peter. And they only react to reverse the death. Reverse the death. Reverse the death. And of course, that was... You, get, you really get that picture because God laid it out there with the Shunammite. She's just like, I can't believe this. I can't believe, you know. And so now she had to believe that something would happen or she wouldn't have taken that journey, you know, to get Elisha, right? I mean, surely she knew, she was thinking something's going to happen. But she was still just wrapped up in the whole thing. I mean, the trip, and then when you get there and all of that. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, I, we stepped back a little bit to the beginning of that story uh, there in Kings, and <clears throat> you see her and her husband, and they see this, this prophet passing by regularly, you know, and you see it and you go, oh, we should fix up a little place, a little place for the prophet. And we should give him a nice little bed and a, and a table and a candle. Well, that, that was a blessing, it was. I mean, but if that's all you got, he's kind of looking for death, you know what I mean? But anyway, so, you know, it's like, okay, here, <clears throat> all right. The son dies. She tells the father, go get him, throw him on, into the bed of the prophet. He'll not sleep there comfortably anymore until he raises this kid from the dead. You see what I mean? I mean, you know, why put him in the bed? You know, well, he'll be coming soon and he'll see where you are and he'll be confronted with this situation. Well, and it was, it was uh, interesting that the Lord didn't tell him what was going on. Didn't tell him. So he's like, but he could tell that she was grieved in heart, you know, and probably assumed. <clears throat> but, you know, the first sight of it is, here's your bed that I gave to you. Clean it up. Make the bed. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I think that Abraham and Sarah had had uh, a lot of opportunities to be introduced to death in relationship to the firstborn. You, you see that when God would, would show up and then God would... Um, say something more about it, and then Abraham would build an altar. And I'm sure she saw him build altars regularly, amen? But this lady, the Shunammite, uh, she, she had, this was, you know, a surprise upon surprises. So she's, she's freaking out, I don't know. Well, guess what? Now, me telling you, honestly, me telling you all this, me telling you this, makes you think that when you get to that situation, you're going to be different. But it's not going to be the exact thing that you think. God doesn't do it the same way every time. He's, he does the same thing, as it were, but, you know. I mean, if you, if you built your great ministry and, you know, it was just fabulous and everybody knew you and you had 10,000 people come in and to hear you and all this kind of stuff and then you know he burned it down and in the process of burning it down kills all your congress and co congregation you would go what what did i do wrong and that's usually it where did i sin or what did i do wrong 
right? I mean, a lot of times we do that. He's going, this has nothing to do with sin. Same thing with Job. Job's, Job's wrestling was over the fact that he felt like he had done nothing wrong and this was unjust sufferings. Well, in truth, he hadn't done anything wrong that caused God to do these things. It wasn't something wrong he did. It was God saying, okay, Satan, you see my God down there? He didn't say, he's a sinner and he's a bad guy, go get him. He said, has there been anyone like him? Right? That's what he said. He's, he's pumping the guy up in front of Satan. Don't do that to me, Lord. <laughs> you know? But he, you know. And when, when Job wakes up, as it were, when he wakes up, the realization is, you know, I'm a wretched man not because of sin. I'm a wretched man because I didn't understand suffering that was apart from sin. Or, or other categories, you understand what I'm trying to say. Other categories, not just sin, but certainly that, you know. Um, I mean, which, is, which is, comes out of what book as the, as the theme? First Peter. One of the things you're going to realize in that first Peter class is that this theme is all throughout the Old and New Testament. It is very prevalent. <clears throat> anyway, um, so I'll read that. Uh, that one sentence for many such things are strange fire and they only react to the reverse to reverse the death they're trying to reverse the death in their minds they become victims who only want to blame others a small example of handling this property this properly is found in psalm 38 oh man psalm 38 okay where David doesn't blame the whole thing on the evildoers, but takes the blame for his part. If there, if there is that, he doesn't scapegoat them, even though while they scapegoat him. In other words, they're scapegoating him and laying all this junk on him, and he is not going to become... They're doing it, and therefore doing it, they're evildoers, right? Right? He's not going to become an evildoer. He will not become what they're doing to him. Well, how do you do that? Not by not saying what's in your heart because you really feel like blasting them and wish, you, know, you want to be like the great red dragon and you know, flood come out of your mouth and watch. Oh, no, there went our little thing. It didn't break. <laughs> I was afraid that thing being loose was going to come off like that. Anyway, that was thunder, the Lord speaking to us. See, they don't know. <clears throat> but, well, let's, let's look at this. Let's look at Psalm 38. It's fairly short. We're, we're only going to start at verse 11 and go through verse 22. Well, that's short compared to some of these psalms. I forget this one how much it is, but... <clears throat> Okay, so he's going through this thing. They are scapegoating, Psalm 38, verse 11. And he says, My lovers and friends stand aloof from my sore, my, and my kinsmen stand afar off. So what has happened here? Well, I'll tell you what has happened here. The evildoers or the accusers, like in uh, um, Daniel 3, the accusers have come and said all this stuff and scapegoated him as if he did it. And it's caused his lovers and friends and kinsmen to back off. All right, now let's just think about that for a second. 
How would you feel if, if all the people that you love and your friends and your people that are in your family have heard something and it sounds, it sounds, you know, realistic or it sounds like it could be true or is true and they all just start, they don't have nothing to do with you again. What, what do you do? What do you do? What would you do with that? Would, first of all, can you imagine that happening? Okay, if you can imagine it happening, then you're left with a vacuum in your life that you better fill with the lamb or you're going to become an evildoer, just like what they did to you. All right? <clears throat> Verse 12, they also that seek after my life lay snares for me and they that Seek my hurt, speak mischievous things, and imagine deceits all the day long. Okay, so they're seeking, they, they're trying to destroy this person. And evildoers are really usually trying to do that. I mean, it's not just bad words that they're saying. It's the effect it has on people. And people that you think, well, they would never believe that about me. Oh, you don't, you don't understand evildoers then. You don't understand how you know, things that can be uh, totally untrue can sound true to everybody and be mo motivated by it. <clears throat> so he says, they seek my hurt. They're laying snares for me, meaning trying to, if, if you could put it like this, uh, they're um, setting up situations so that you could be quote unquote caught, whatever, and it looked like this thing is going on and you are not, but that's what they think is going on. And they take pictures, the evildoers and videos, and they splatter them all over the internet. Nobody's done that to me or whatever. And they weren't, you know, I'm not talking about me. But, and the, the pictures, there's an, there's an explanation. And while, with these words, it looks like that. With these words, it looks like something completely different. Can that happen to you? Will it probably? I don't know. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, they imagine deceits all the day long. Verse 13. But I, as a deaf man, heard not. He's not listening to the garbage. Do you see that? His ears belong to the Lord. But it's not just going to be his ears. Okay? I heard not, and I was as a dumb man that opened not his mouth. His tongue and his mouth belong to the Lord too. So he's not, he, you, you know, you're better off not listening to that stuff in the first place. Just be with the Lord. Just have the spirit of Christ. It doesn't matter how, how horrible someone has been framed in a picture of looking like this. They may be the lamb and they're not speaking up because they don't, they've got nothing to say except for to bless and curse not and you know turn the other cheek and amen. But how would you know? How would anyone know that that's what they're doing? In most cases, they wouldn't, especially people all over the Internet. They're not going to, you know, they'll just read. You know, it's amazing to me. I mean, this is just maybe me. It's amazing to me how people believe everything that's on the Internet. I don't get that. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so. He talks about his mouth. He didn't open his mouth, which we know that represents Christ to also Thus I was as a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. Yeah. Now, that's going through the fire and coming out with the Spirit of Christ. Amen? But there's more. <laughs> Verse 15. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. See, there's a real deal. We say, well, I hope in the Lord. Let me tell you, when if that picture could be painted where something splattered all over the internet 
and your friends and your kinsmen, your family meaning, and your people that love you and all of that, and they turn on you. Um, he says, I'm hoping in you. Would you hope in him? You say, well, I think I would. <laughs> You would, be, you would want to strike back until, until you got into the corridor properly. <clears throat> uh, For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Adonai, my God. Hmm? Is that good? It's wonderful. Verse 16, for I said, hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me when my foot slippeth. Okay, so he's saying, you know, just keep me. If you can keep me, I can take the, the heat. Yes. If you can keep me, I, I'll, I'll be able to take it. All right, so that's good. That's a, that means he really is trusting. <clears throat> um, for I said... Um, uh, let's see, they magnify themselves against me. Okay, and so the word magnify is you take something that's tiny and you take a magnifying glass and you make it way bigger. They're magnifying everything, all this stuff. Now, if you're not going through this, you, you'll be lucky to remember this class. You'll be lucky to even remember the class. But this is where the Rubber meets the road, right here. This is the most important thing once you get saved on your road that you can glorify God in. All right, so uh, verse 17, for I'm ready to halt and my sorrow is continually before me. In other words, he's not just perfect walking around going, I don't care whatever, you know, it, there's stuff you go through, but he's trusting in the Lord and he know, and he's not trusting in, I could say this and that would show them that they're, show everyone that they're the bad person. Or I could pull this out and show them that, da, 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 da. or God knows that I'm better person than they are. And so, you know, we, we have all this stuff, and the thing is, God doesn't mind that stuff rising because he wants to see what you're going to do with it. Amen? Amen. They magnify. All right, verse 18. For I will declare mine iniquity, I will be sorry for my sin. He's saying, look, if there's stuff I did, I'm going to take my part, but these evildoers are going way overboard. Amen? They're going way overboard. See, one of the things we do is, well, you know, we'll go, I didn't, you know, whatever I did is nothing compared to what they do. Doesn't people know that, that da, 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 da? I mean, I mean, they could probably just look at their life and know that I'm better than they are. <laughs> this kind of stuff comes up, you know. And the Lord's going, stinky, stinky. <laughs> You know, no sweet savor of Christ coming up here. <clears throat> Verse 19, but mine enemies are lively and they are strong and they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. All right, so, you know, you're, you're like, you know, these guys are lively, meaning they're all over the place with this stuff, you know. They're, they have taken it all over the internet. They've gone to everybody's house or, or emailed them or talked to them face to face to convince the world that this is true. And, you know, and they're strong. But David's going through willing weakness. Do you understand willing weakness? Willing weakness is that you willingly don't fight back. Not God has to constrain you. And, mm, shut up! 
<laughs> you, you have to go, you know what? This Jesus and being with him is way more important than how I look to the whole world. Right? All right. And they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. Verse 20, they also that render evil for good. Okay. Because this can go through your little mind. I can't believe they're doing this. Because I have done nothing but bless them, help them. I've been there when they went through stuff. I've, you know, I, I've done all these things. Okay, those kind of thoughts are counterproductive. They're, because they're not Christ. They're not going in the right direction. They may even be true, but your justification can't be that or you're already in trouble. Yes, Lord. <clears throat> Um, they, they also that render evil for good are mine adversaries because I follow the thing that is good, meaning I'm, I'm staying with the Lord. Uh, I, in other words, I have every right to render evil back to them because they rendered me evil. But Jesus didn't say, bless those who bless you. He says, bless those that curse you. I remember years ago, I think it was Scott. Years ago, I was going through something and, and uh, Scott said something to me and he said, uh, you know, it just seems like the enemies really, these enemies are doing all this stuff. And I remember saying to him, they're not my enemies. I may be their enemy, but they're not my enemies. And still not. Still not. At all. I can say not even a little bit. But you only say that if you're going to be with the Lord and the greatest thing that comes out of it has nothing to do with what they did except that that caused you to, to shut everything else down and say, you know what? When it's all done, I glorified the Lord. <gasps> Woo! Finished my my course, yeah. <clears throat> Almost done here. Uh, verse 21. Forsake me not, O Lord, O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Adonai, my salvation. <laughs> See, he's not calling on God to to smite them or to get them or to reprove them or to show them that you're you're something different than what they have framed you as when i say frame meaning presented you as in their minds or to people <clears throat> um he is talking about adonai saving him that's different Adonai won't save you from the quarter, or Adonai won't save you from the sufferings of Christ. He won't do that. Because that area, he wants you to go through it, but he wants you, again, as the three Hebrew children, or there's, there's stronger pictures than that, but to, to say, I'd rather be with him in the fire. I would, you know, or Moses, I'd rather, you know, what? Yeah, suffer the sufferings of Christ, then I count that greater riches than, greater riches than, greater riches than all the riches of Egypt. I will no longer be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I will step down from all the high things, all the things that I held as important, all the things that moved me and motivated me and talked to me and stirred something within me, I'm, I am now dead to that. I am now with the Lord. I'm with the Lord. And I want, and, and I'm right where I want to be. When you do that, you will never know what that really feels like. 
because no words that uh, I could say or anything can make that sound <laughs> very good, you know, because it's, it's embracing j just beasts and, and saying, okay, you're helping me. We all believe that theologically, but we don't believe that inside. We don't. We still want to fight them. We still want to talk about them. We still want to put them back in a bad light so that my light's a little brighter than theirs so that I'm more acceptable. <clears throat> but it's better to be with the Lord. It's better to love the Lord, to long after the Lord, to, to, uh, to have his spirit on you, uh, if you will, Adonai, carrying you and teaching you and bringing you into something that's called eternal life. Bring you into eternal life, finally, in a real way. So Father, we thank you and we love you. And Lord, there are things um, that stir in your heart and maybe Lord that you want to um, you want us to pray or open our hearts right now to that which is greater than our earthly lives, our circumstances, the things that have made up our life, the vast majority of our life, and at least to turn to you and ask. Um, could you, by your grace, begin to break me loose of the safe haven of my making in the bay where it's not many storms and not many huge waves. And let me loose into the storms that are out there in that big ocean and let your spirit guide in the storm. Let him be the rudder and let him be the strong mast. And may we trust in your course and in your way.